Please remain standing as we're going to read the Word of God. That's what we do here, right? Yes. We're going to be in John chapter 19. If you have your Bible. John chapter 19. Oh, let me put my glasses on. Everyone's like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. John 19, chapter 1. So then, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and I have power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from me. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat, and he placed it as called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day on the, of the Passover, about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. Father, as we look at this story here of the death of your son, Jesus, uh, it breaks our heart, but it also inspires us because we know that that was the cause of our redemption being paid for, Lord. So, Father, we pray as we look to your word, you would give us ears of what your spirit would say. And I pray I would increase and, and, and or you would increase and I would decrease as I just want to try and share what you want, Lord. So help us to learn more about you and more of an appreciation for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So the title of this message is The Mock Trial. The Courageous Conqueror versus the Compromising Coward. The Mock Trial, The Courageous Conqueror versus the Compromising Coward. You probably know who those people are, but if you don't, you'll see as the st st study plays out. In verse 19, it says, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. I just can't believe that. He took him and scourged him. Because when we last uh, spoke, in verse 38 of the last chapter, the last thing we heard from Pilate is, I find no fault in him at all. Why are you going to do, why are you going to scourge somebody in somebody you don't find fault in? Scourging is what the Romans would do. It's about the most evil, humiliating thing you could do to somebody. It's basically whipping him. If you ever, if any of you saw the movie The Passion, that was pretty accurate. It was pretty, it was probably even more brutal than that, but just seeing that was brutal. But that's basically what happened is they would take somebody and they would bend him over with no shirt and they would tie him on something and then they would whip him. And they would always whip him about 39 times because 40 was the max and they'd always say, oh, we're going to be merciful and show you 39. But really half the people, not half the people, but many of the people would actually die. Because what they would whip him with was a thing called the, cat of Roman, uh, the Roman cat of nine tails. It was a, a little handle and on the handle you had these, these three... Um, leather straps that turn into nine leather straps, but in the leather they would embed pieces of bone, glass, metal, rock, and when they drug it across that back, it would just rip it wide open. And often they were trying to, they would try to get a confession from a prisoner that was trying to claim that he was innocent. Um, and some people, they weren't even, they were innocent, but because of the pain, they would just, I did it, I did it. It was so painful. 
And they would lose so much blood that often these people would die. And so when you read, I find no fault in him, and yet I just allowed this to be done to him. You're like, wow, this guy is really evil. Or is he a real compromising coward? D, all of the above. It's just pretty sad. But then in verse 2 it says, And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. What's sad about this is if you go to the other Gospels, it talks about how th this was a, a, a way of mocking him and actually humiliating him. You know, a king would wear a gold crown. Well, they would put a crown of thorns on. And they would put this, this robe, this purple robe, after he was all beaten and bloodied. And they'd say, Oh, hail, King of the Jews. And they'd give him a little palm branch or something, and, 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 and like a scepter. Oh, you're the scepter, you're the ruler. And then they would hit him with it. Or they blindfold him and they pulled out his beard. They did all of this evil stuff, and it just was also a cause to humiliate him. And it it just breaks your heart when you hear that. But it also shows you how awesome Jesus is. He is amazing. He is the most courageous person that ever walked the face of the earth. And uh, amen. so, amen, exactly. And then in verse 4, Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. We read in some of the other Gospels also that he said, therefore I will chastise him that I may release him. Now what he meant by that is, okay, I'm just going to punish this guy, but then you guys should be okay with this, and then I'm going to release him. He actually thought that the Jewish leaders would be okay with that. But as we read the story, they weren't okay with that. They hated Jesus. They hated him so much, they just wanted him dead. That's all they wanted. They wanted to eliminate this problem by killing him. And so he says, um, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Like, like Pilate thinks that's letting him off the hook. Hey, I'm letting you know that you know I find no fault on him. Even though I just beat him within an inch of his life, which is kind of a, a real contradiction there. But in verse 5, it says, Then Pilate came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. There's been a lot of sermons just on that. Behold the man. Because you are not going to find anybody that's more manly than Jesus. We talked about how it wasn't just that he endured things, but he had the power to stop it. He wasn't like a man in the sense that he could have tried to do something and, and he wouldn't have got very far because you have all these Romans that are soldiers and you already have all your energy gone and you're, you're beaten like a bloody pulp. But this was the Son of God. And when they arrested him, and remember Peter drew the sword, and Peter he said, put the sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Don't you think I can call on my father right now and pray, and 12 legions of angels would, would be dispatched like right then? But he didn't do it. You know why? Because he loves us. For the joy that was set before him, it says he's endured this cross and despised the shame, and he, even, he was obedient even to the point of death, the death of the cross. Because the death, the death of the cross was not only the most barbaric and the most torturous, but it was also the most humiliating. Because often they would put him, they would put him on one of the roads out of outer end of town where people would walk by. And you've probably seen this in a few of the movies. Where they'd show him up there, and people would walk by, and it was like a warning, like don't mess with Rome. But it was also like this is a criminal, you know. And it was humiliating because often they would just. Give him just like a little loincloth or something. He'd be out there freezing and just dying. It was just humiliating. But you know what? God gets the last laugh, if you want to call it that, the last laugh. Because God is going to judge. No one, no one gets away with evil. We think we see people get away with evil. People do not get away with evil. Because as much as we want to, we want to, because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. As much as we want to often repay someone because we're so mad and it's so evil and they did us so wrong and we want to let them have it, they're going to get so much worse in a place called hell if they don't repent of their sins. It, is, it talks about tormenting ever, forever, and ever, day and night, where the worm is, uh, uh, cries out or is, uh, is, the fire is not quenched, where the worm dies. It's just a weird, it's a darkness. It's, 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 a, it's a terrible place. They will suffer for all eternity. But God often will judge on this side of heaven too. And he does that. Pilate is not getting away with nothing. These religious leaders, they're not getting away with nothing. And Jesus knows that. He knows their time is coming. But he knows he has a greater purpose. 
His greater purpose is to go to the cross. No one suffered like Jesus. People, I know people have been tortured and, and murdered throughout history. Sadly, that's the, the condition of man, the fallen nature of man. But on the level that Jesus did, and he did not, he did not turn away from it. We had Sister Shelley read that, that passage in Isaiah, and it says he set his face like flint. Like he says, I am not, nothing's, nothing's getting me off this. I love these people so much, I'm going to go through whatever I have to go through. That was the love he had for us. Behold the man. That's a man. That's a man's man. A man who can take it, even though he has the power to do something about it, he refuses to because he has a greater cause. There's a greater cause for him, and that was us. Verse 6. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Okay, that's the third time you said this, Pilate. I mean, you say you find no fault in him, and yet you're, you're just allowing this to happen. But he actually thought that the, the religious leaders would say, okay, man, that's, that's a lot worse than I thought. Man, no, we didn't want that. I mean, we just wanted him to stop preaching, you know. Immediately, it almost sounds like crucify him, crucify him. Like they didn't even, didn't even dawn on him. They didn't even think about it. They just saw him and said, crucify him. We want him dead. That's, that's not enough. That's how evil is. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get so surprised when I see the evil things that people are doing. And, and nowadays, a lot of this is these are people in authority that just gets under our skin. I'm like, how could they actually do that? How could they actually not see how evil that is? Well, if you remember, one of the biggest differences between Jesus and Pilate, I mean, it's a difference between night and day, is Jesus is the truth. And he said, I came to bear witness of the truth. And then Pilate said, what is truth? And he just like walks away. Like a total disrespect for truth. And this is what I find. When a sinner is just totally doesn't care about truth, he will do anything. No, I mean, what I mean is nothing will surprise me. You've already gone down that, that road of evil. Like, I don't want to hear correction. I don't want to hear the truth. I want to do it my way. And it can get more evil and more evil and more evil. And, and that's what sin does. Sin is a liar. Oh, you can get away with this. If you do this, it's really good. And all of a sudden you realize it's not that good. But then maybe you decide to do a little more. You do a little more. Next thing you know, you're doing things twice as evil as you ever thought. So when I see stuff like that, I'm like, that sin playing its, playing its hand, playing its way out. And we can never be surprised at the evil that men will do when they don't have Christ in them, when they don't live after the truth. And that's where Pilate was. And that's where religious leaders were. They didn't have the Lord. They didn't have Christ, which is so sad. Because these are the religious leaders. They're supposed to be the ones that represent God, right? Well, obviously they're not, and it's just so sad. But now look in verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Well, in the Old Testament, it does say, Don't blaspheme, don't use the Lord's name in vain. So if some guy is saying he's the Son of God, then they have a point. But what if it is the Son of God? Which we know it is. Jesus revealed himself so much to these guys, they had no excuse. There was a song we used to sing called Awesome God. It's like 30 years old. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom and power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Wisdom, power, love. Jesus was all that. To the thousandth power, if you will. He was all wisdom. One of my favorite verses is the, is the last verse of um, chapter 7 of Matthew when Jesus gives the greatest sermon ever told, the Sermon on the Mount. And it says, The people were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as a man with authority and not as the scribes. What a slap in the face to the religious leaders. It's like, this dude's got authority and you guys are, or we're listening to you guys. He had so much authority and he spoke with the wisdom and his parables and his teachings were so deep and so rich that people would just hang on his every word because it was, it was God himself teaching. He had so much wisdom. And we know he had so much love. We're seeing it right here. I think of the woman caught in adultery and the, the religious leaders wanted to stone her and he basically called these guys out for them sin, their sin. And he says, where are your accusers? None, my Lord. He goes, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. He showed compassion. And Jesus would show compassion and love like no other. You know, we're going to read in a couple of weeks where he's going to, 
He's going to restore Peter, his own disciple that betrayed him. Why? Because he's loving, he's compassionate. No one has the love and compassion of Jesus. And you know what? That's the love you and I are supposed to have. A new commandment I give you, Jesus says, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for each other. Not the love of the world, the love of God, the unconditional. That's what we're supposed to have, husbands for our wives. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's a sacrificing life, sacrificial, sanctifying love that Jesus has. His love is off the charts. We read in, in 1 John, God is love. He's not just the author of love or the demonstration of love. He is love. And he's power. Oh my gosh, is he power. I mean, these guys saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. And you know what they did? They wanted to kill Lazarus. Because they said, man, people are turning to Jesus after he just raised him from the dead. It's like, hello, this guy might be from God. I mean, this doesn't happen all the time. He also gave sight to the blind. He also touched and healed lepers. You don't touch and heal lepers. You run from them. That's what people do. You know, but he would touch them and heal them. Another time, he was in a place teaching, and it was so crowded that people couldn't get in that these people had this guy that they loved so much, they went in the roof and they opened the ceiling tiles and they let this guy down. And Jesus was like admiring his faith. But in the crowd, there were a couple scribes, a couple Pharisees. And he looked at him and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And also he looks at these guys and he goes, Why do you think evil in your heart? Who can forgive sins but God alone, right? He says, But yet you may know that the Son of God has the power on earth to forgive sins. He says, I say to you, rise up and walk. And this guy rose up and he healed him and walked. And these guys saw that. They saw his miracles. They saw his power. They saw him, you know, all the great things he did, but they just didn't believe it. And even Isaiah 61, which is a prophecy of Jesus, Jesus quoted it when he sat in the temple in Nazareth in Luke 14. I'm not Luke 14, Luke 4. And they, they gave him the scroll of Isaiah. He reads the scroll of Isaiah, and you know what he reads? He reads about himself. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to restore the sight of those that are blind, to set those who are oppressed by the devil. It, those were all him. He did that. Remember the demon-possessed man? Jesus healed him, and it says that he was sitting at Jesus clothed and in his right mind. This guy was a full-blown maniac. Read the story. Read the story of the Gadarean guy. He's like running around at night, howling at the moon, you know, screaming, screaming and cutting himself, breaking chains. He was no clothes on. It's like, get away from that island. Don't even go near there. And Jesus comes in and sets him free. And then he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. Wow. Our Savior is so powerful. I don't care what sin you've done. I don't care what has a grip on you. You can be literally set free by the power of Jesus Christ. His blood was shed and his, he drove, rose again on the resurrection day to show that he has power over death as well. Jesus can heal anybody and do anything. Yeah. These guys had him right in their midst and you know what they want to do? They want to kill him. That's canceled culture at its worst right there. I don't just want to hear you. I don't want to silence your message. I want to silence you. I want to snuff you out. I don't even want you living. And sadly, there's, that's part of what this council culture is. There are people that actually wouldn't care if you lost your life because lives have been lost through that. But that's a whole different story. But Jesus is just so amazing. And he's telling them he made himself the son of God. Now look at verse 8. Therefore, when Pilate, Pilate heard that saying, he said, oh, well, he didn't say that. It says, <laughs> then when Pilate heard that, he was the more afraid. He wasn't afraid. He was more afraid. He wasn't more afraid. He was the more afraid. It's like he was already kind of like, there's something different about this dude. Now he's like, oh, man, wow, this guy's a son of God. Man, I'm, I could be really be blown in here. So it almost sounds like he's thinking rationally for a millisecond. And then it says, he went into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? Where are you from? Well, Jesus kind of answered that question last week, right, in our lesson. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight for you, for me. But I am not of this world. And that's what he's telling us. I am not of this world. He's in the world, but he's not of the world. Kind of like us, you know. We're from another world. We're, we're pilgrims passing through. We're just temporary people here. 
This is not our home. Our home was up in heaven with Jesus, right? But um, I was thinking about, look at the very next uh, part of that, the last part of verse 9. But Jesus gave him no answer. This was, I was going to have Shelley read this, but um, I had her read that instead. This is in Psalm 53. This is a prophecy of Jesus, the Messiah. And it says in, in chapter 53, I'm just going to pick it up in verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. That's another word for sins, intentional sin. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's another word for sin. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Him taking those stripes, somehow there's power in that to heal people. I don't, I don't get it, but that's what the Bible says. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a slam to the slaughter, a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And then it goes on to say, he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's pretty powerful. That's a prophecy where it says he was silent. But you're like, wait a second. He says something in verse 11, and he, and he said something back in verse 36 and 37. And I started thinking about that. I said, well, he did talk. But you know what he was silent about? He was silent about in defending himself. He spoke the truth in love. My kingdom is not from this world. And I've come, Pilate, to bear witness of the truth. He gave Pilate an opportunity. I have come to wear, bear witness of the truth, he says at the end of chapter 18. Then he says this, he who is of the truth hears my voice. That's like, that's me, Pilate. Pilate says, what is truth? And he walks away. Also in the story here, in, I think it's in Matthew, Pilate is in the middle of bringing judgment on Jesus. And somebody gets a messenger from his wife. Guys, you got to listen to your wife sometimes. Listen to this. She says, have nothing to do with that just and righteous man. I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. That was for Pilate. Pilate, your wife is saying, this is a bad deal. This is not the guy, you know. And Pilate did, did it anyways. And uh, But Pilate, you know, God gave him, op Jesus gave him opportunities. It's just sad. So his he wasn't really defending himself with by not speaking. But when he spoke... Like in another, another gospel, are you the son of God? He says, it is as you say. He was speaking truth, but he wasn't defending himself. Like, get me off the cross. I don't belong here. This is wrong. This is injustice. He wasn't defending himself. And I just think of David in Psalm 62. He says, the Lord is my salvation. He is my defense. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. The Lord is my defense. He lets the Lord fight his battles in, as far as defending himself. And that's what Jesus is doing here. You know, I was also thinking about when it talks about our witness as a, as a Christian. It talks about Jesus in John, in, um, I'm sorry, in um, Philippians 2. It says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Or what he's saying is he did not take on his, his div divine prerogatives to use his power for himself. He went to the cross. And then it says something in red. It says then it's all of a sudden he shifts gears. He's talking to the Christian. Do all things without complaining and without murmuring. That you may be a witnesses of God. That you may be a witness for God. Jesus was the ultimate person of not being a complainer. When he had everything to complain about. And grumbling and he had everything to, to grumble about. Because he'd already got that right with the Father. Remember in the garden? Not my will but yours be done Lord. He already made that. And then he says in verse 11. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. I'm sorry, I think I missed uh, chapter, verse 10. Then Pilate said, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and I have power to release you? Think about what he's saying. Okay, Pilate, you said you have power to release him, then why don't you release him? You're telling us about this great power, well, release him. Paul tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians 13 and uh, I think a couple other places, 
Authority is given for edification, not for destruction. Authority, leadership, those types of things are, are, are given to build people up, not to put people down. And that's what this guy was doing. He was using his authority for negative. He wasn't using his authority for positive. You know, when it says here, this is the thing we got to realize, you know. We see people in places of authority that we don't agree with. And we're like, God, why are they there? Why are you allowing this? Well, God does allow this. I want to read this out of Romans. Romans chapter 13 says, verse 1, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. God sets up governments, but that doesn't mean there's always good people in there. Because if you carry on this passage in thirteen, chapter 13 of Romans, it says that he is there... Uh, he is God's minister for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. He does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister mm -hmm. and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. That's a really good law enforcement verse there, because they're there to promote good and to punish evil. Well, so is the leader. He's supposed to be doing good, not doing evil. So, like I said, this guy is going to get judged, and he's not using his power properly. But then Jesus just gives us this great verse this great word in verse 11. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who has delivered me to you has the greater sin. He's pointing out the principle, okay, you know, Romans 13, Pilate, you got power from above, but you got to use the power wisely. you got to use it in a godly way. But then he says something really interesting. But the person that gave you to me has the greater sin. And I thought about that. That's the Pharisees. The religious leaders are the one that gave him to Pilate. And I thought, that's the greater sin. And I started thinking, remember last week we were talking about in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, it says there's seven, six things the Lord hates, no seven are an abomination. We talked about that. Well, two of them were lying, we said, right? Which we see. One is being haughty, like thinking you're you know, being proudful. We see that. One is the shedding of innocent blood, which you can't get no more innocent than the blood of Jesus. We see that. Uh, the last one is sowing discord among the brethren. Uh, but in between, there's two verses. One is one who invents evil or one who plans or devises wicked plans. And then the, the one after it is those who are swift in running to evil. And what you're going to see play out in the story is, is what we call mob psychology, where there's these people that are there and the, 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 the religious leaders are going to incite these people. They're going to persuade these people to ask for Jesus to be crucified. But Jesus is saying, the one who sent you to me has more sin. And this is, I started thinking about that. Okay, so if you just sin, you sin. But when you devise evil plans, you're employing a whole bunch of other people to sin. Your sin is going far beyond your own personal sin. These guys, their plan of sin, drug in Pilate, drug in the Roman soldiers, drug in the people that said, crucify him, his blood be upon us. And upon our children, these guys sin as a result of their sin. And there's people in our country that do that. They incite little, in the middle of a protest, they get a couple of evildoers in there to incite violence by throwing little, um, ma like a Mai Tai cocktails of things. Ma I don't drink that stuff, so I don't know. I don't drink cocktails, so I can't say it right. I mentioned, <laughs> never mind, never mind. Anyways, so somebody will throw one of those, or they'll, they'll bash in a window, or they'll set a business on fire, and all of a sudden, hundreds of people will join them. The guy who planned that, that's the one who's, I mean, they're all accountable. We're all accountable for our sin, but Jesus makes a very interesting point. When you have evil, and you devise it, and others partake of it, man, wow, that's really bad. Verse 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the, okay, okay, so in verse 8, he says, when therefore Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And in verse 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release them. So from those two things, okay, he's, he's really starting to believe Jesus. I think he really wants to set him free. The very next word, but the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friends. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, and then he's going to deliver him to be crucified. Guys, that is compromise to the max right there. 
That is compromised. But notice verse 8. Therefore when Pilate heard. Verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard. Don't base bad decisions on what others say. Or don't base decisions on what others say. Base decisions on what God says. If he had listened to God, he'd have, he'd have done the right thing. He'd been okay. But he didn't listen to people. He started to kind of listen to God. He started to kind of listen to his conscience. But he was not grounded in truth. Remember, he said, what is truth? And he walked off. He, couldn't, he didn't have the moral courage to do the right thing because he was not grounded in truth. So though he heard the truth and he knew what was right, he gave in to be more concerned about what the people thought. See, he says, you guys, you are, they said, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king is not, is not a friend of Caesar. So he's like, oh my gosh, if this gets back to Caesar, that this guy complained himself a king, someone who would be in competition with my king, the Caesar, this is not good. I could lose my job. And that's basically what, what motivated his decision. And it's just so sad. It's just so sad. It says he, he heard that and he sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gotha. Now it was the Passover day and the Passover about the sixth hour. And then he says to the Jews, like he's still kind of trying, like, hey, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Notice in um, earlier in verse six, it's the chief priests and the officers that say crucify him. But then if you look down in 14, he says to the Jews, behold the, your king, and they cry out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. When you read in the other Gospels, we read that the um, chief priests persuaded the multitudes. And I remember one of the many movies I watched of Jesus, it was really interesting. They had all these people, and they showed these, all these chief priests or the religious leaders, they would infiltrate the crowds, and they'd get like, evenly spaced throughout the crowds and then they would say crucify him crucify him yeah crucify him. like they they incited the crowd they strategically put their guys there and that's kind of what happened but now it's the people that are saying away with them away with them you know sadly there's still people that say that today about jesus away with them get him out of here i don't want to hear it there's people that say they love god or they know god or they believe things about god but when it comes to really following god Away with him. I don't want to hear. I don't want to go so far. Away with him. Away with him. And the thing is, this is a deal. It says, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Away with him, away with him will lead to crucify him. When you reject God and you say away with him, I don't want to hear it. Talk to the hand. I'm done with that. Remember that? Talk to the hand. I don't want to hear it. You're eventually going to have the attitude of crucify him. Because that's what sin is going to do. Oh, this isn't that bad. Oh, I love God. I'm not all in like some of you guys, but I'm not all, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not like God. Well, this is what Jesus said. You're either for me or you're against me. He didn't give no middle ground. To be undecided is to be decided. You're either for him or you're against him. And he puts it this way. You're either gathering people to me or you're pushing people away from me. That's kind of the difference. And Jesus laid his life down for every human being that ever walked on the face of the earth. Everyone, everyone, anybody can be saved. Anybody can have their sins forgiven. And everybody is going to be accountable for their sin. The Bible says it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. See, that, 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 what that means is the moment you die, you're, you're saying that you're, you're feeding. I'm, kind of, I'm combining two words that's not coming out right. My wife would say, you're just talking too fast. What do you mean talking too fast? That's a bad joke. I meant to say, your fate is sealed, and I started to say, your fate is sealed. And that just didn't... <laughs> so your fate is sealed once you take your last breath. You talked about it in, in Revelation, it says, he who is holy, let him be holy still. He who is um, unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. When you die, that's how you enter into eternity. You don't go bargaining before the Lord and say, well, look all the great things I've done. He goes, you made your decision. Choose this day whom you will serve, Joshua said. Often in the Bible, it talks about make a choice. Throughout the Bible, you will see make a choice. If God, if God is God, serve him. Choose God, choose God, choose God. We are told to choose God. That's what we're called to choose. So we are going to have communion here. And I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And um, after that, I'm just going to mention a couple things. They're going to start playing a song.
about communion. And then we're going to have a, a couple, Bart and Melissa, they're going to come up and they're going to pray for the communion. But this is interesting. In the Bible, we see, we see Pilate mocking Jesus. We see the religious leaders mocking Jesus. And when it comes to communion, this is a really holy moment for the church. Because we are recognizing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He, he shed his blood. His body was beaten. That's what the two elements represent. But the Bible says, don't take communion in an unworthy manner. What that means is don't be flippant like Pilate was. What is truth? Like, like you take the communion, like you don't even think about, oh, well, whatever, everyone's doing it, I guess I'll do it. No, this isn't juice and cracker. This is not a snack. This is, you are recognizing this, this represents the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. And the Bible says that you are not to have a flippant mentality when you take communion. It also says you really shouldn't take communion unless you're a Christian. That's what the Bible says. You're, you can actually drink judgment on yourself. When you, it says don't insult the spirit of grace and, and act like the, uh, the shedding of his blood was just a common thing, like it was no big deal. And if any of you don't have a communion element, raise your hand. Jeff's going to hand it out to you if you didn't pick up one when you're coming in. So we're going to take communion, but the Bible also says that we are to examine ourselves. For the man and woman who's a Christian, you examine yourself. Am I where I need to be? Am I living the life God wants me to be? This might be the time, Lord, you know what? You know what I did earlier this week? Forgive me. I'm sorry. And I don't want to go there. And I just want to ask for your forgiveness. And then I want to just reflect on how wonderful you are. For the non-believer, for the one that's on the fence, it tells us to examine in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. It says, examine yourself. Are you in the faith? Lest you be disqualified. What he's saying, he was talking to the church. There were people in the church that thought they were saved. And he says, no, examine yourself. Are you in the faith? Lest you become disqualified. What does it mean to be in the faith? What it means to be in the faith is, I have come to believe in Jesus and I want to follow him. When Jesus first came on this earth, you know what the first thing he said when he, when he started his ministry was repent and believe in the gospel. A lot of people hear the believe part, but they don't really get or like the, the repent part. The Bible says godly sorrow produces repentance. Meaning when you're sorry for something, if you're godly sorrow, you repent of it. There's people that are sorry, they're sorry they got caught or they got the consequences of doing wrong things. But when you're truly sorry, you change your direction. It goes like this. Instead of, it's all about me and what I want to do, I'm turning from that lifestyle, and now I'm going to follow God, and it's all about what he wants to do. And I want to be a better person. I want to, I want to do the right thing. So we need to repent of our sin, and we need to believe the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the message of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. You remember the Old Testament? They would actually slay the blood of an animal. It's called atonement. But, the, but it was an innocent animal. They would slay the blood. They would kill it. But that would cause atonement or forgiveness in a sense for the people. They actually were looking for the ultimate atonement in Jesus. Because he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And after that, there were no more sacrifices. Because he's the only sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed his life. He gave it. We saw it. He didn't argue. He went. And, and next week we're going to talk about he, he's going to go to the cross. He's going to pay it in full. One of the last words he says is, it is finished. What is finished? The redemption, the salvation of mankind. The, 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 the redemption is getting man and, and woman right with God, forgiving them of their sin, wiping their slate clean, clean, that they can have a relationship with God, and when they die, they can go to heaven. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And he rose again from the dead. That's the resurrection, proving he has power over the grave. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he may live. He will live again. That's what the resurrection does. And the Bible says, if you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it talks about believing and confessing that Jesus rose again from the dead. You have to believe it, you have to confess it, and then you have to live it. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And no one can snatch them away from me. No one. They follow me. They don't just believe. Some people think believe means, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Okay, yeah, I agree. I'm not, he didn't say agree. 
He said, pick up your cross daily, deny yourself and follow me. That's why you've heard us say here, every Christian, a disciple, every disciple, a servant, because that's biblical. God's just not looking for somebody that says, oh yeah, I believe, and then they go live their life the way they want. Well, no, when you say you believe, it means you want to follow. So we're going to bow our heads for a word of prayer in a minute here, and I'm going to ask if anybody is not right with God, they're not sure, or they want to return to the God, or return to the Lord, that we would make that right right now. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer of asking Christ to come into your life. Jesus says, I knock at the door. If anyone opens the door, and, 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 uh, opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. Meaning Jesus is saying, if you open your life to me, I will come into it and we will have a relationship together. That's what he wants to do. So bow your heads for a word of prayer. Father, we're so grateful for what you did on the cross. But Lord, we need to make sure that we're where we need to be. We're not saved by what we do. We're saved by what you do. But because we believe in what you did, we give our lives to you. And then we start doing what we can, not to earn it, but as a way of saying thanks and to say that we're your children and we want to follow you. And as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if there's anybody here that is not sure where they are with Jesus, they're not sure if they were to die, that if they would go to heaven. They're not sure that their sin is forgiven. They want that guilt taken away, that gnawing away, that I'm not right with God, I'm not doing things the right way. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now and I want to pray for you. You want to get right with Jesus? You want to give your life to follow the Lord? You want to repent of your sin? You want him to be your savior? If that's you, raise your hand right now and I'm going to pray for you. Anybody? Anybody at all that wants to get right with the Lord, they know that they need to make a change. Lord, you've seen that? you see seen here? I'm just going to say this prayer anyways. Maybe somebody didn't. Maybe they, they, maybe they just don't want to raise their hand. I don't know. But this is what you need to do. Just repeat after me. Dear Lord, forgive me of my sin. I know you died on the cross and rose again. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my King. I promise to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And if you did pray that prayer, we have a table back there with the Bible. We have people who love to pray with you and talk to you. But for the rest of you, we're going to have our friends come up. Well, actually, we're going to do the song, and then we're going to have Bart and Melissa come up and pray. Yeah. So let's do this song first. <laughs>